So a vehicle, we're going to see carrying on improving, carrying on going through rebuilds, carrying on having upgrades, and undoubtedly, again, another one of those Soviet tanks that will be in service for decades to come. I said all that uh, probably about a year ago. I'm just interested now to catch up a little bit with the fighting in the Ukraine at the moment. It's been one of those situations where we've seen an awful lot of reporting with the tank in the news. And of course, um, the tank coming out, what seems to be worse, certainly on the Russian side. So we thought we'd have a little bit of a look at that and because we're here with the Tank Museum, perhaps try and put it into a little bit of a wider context as well because this is not the first time this sort of headlines have hit the papers. Does it really mean to say something like the T-72 tank is completely redundant, obsolete, not up to the task in the modern battlefield? So let's have a look at this. Um, we've got an army that's re-equipped, it's learned some lessons from some other fighting, it's uh, put new technology, it's heavily invested in some new vehicles, into new aircraft, it's actually uh, built up a bit of a navy as well. It's there with what is considered to be a considerable force and when that force first goes into action, um, it suddenly seems to break down. It loses its command and control very quickly. Its resupply, its logistics seem to fail uh, at an alarmingly quick rate. And morale is seemed to be very, very low as well. Now, what's that army? That's France in 1940. So we can look at these parallels that are going on at the moment as if like somehow there's something new I'd probably say they probably aren't that new. Now, what are we seeing? We're seeing at the moment, and I'm talking in April of 2022, we're seeing at the moment an awful lot of imagery very cleverly managed by the Ukrainian forces of uh, Russian military vehicles being knocked out, of them performing very poorly. Now, some of the websites and some of the organisations that keep a track of what's being knocked out, um, geolocating it, making sure there's corroboration so it's not just propaganda, etc. Some of them have already given up because there's so much armour has been knocked out that it's not quite worth following. Um, and we have to say that, that it's very clear, it's not being just propaganda, that the Russian army has failed abysmally in some of its use of its armoured formations. Now, in that, and why because of that, one of the things that we, here at the Tank Museum, we've got that usual set of headlines that come out from some of these things along the lines of, um, is this the end of the tank? But also, you'll see some of the analysis has now been quite good because it's picked up on the fact that things that we can say quite confidently, such as Russian logistics, are failing big time. They just don't seem to be being able to resupply in the manner that they should be. Their vehicles do not look like they've been well maintained. They are certainly not being operated in the manner that many Western intelligence agencies thought they were going to be used in, and certainly not from the old days of the Soviet Union and the how of their combined arms formations, which is a bit of an irony, of course, because in the West, we had picked up from the earlier fighting um, in the Donbass region, that somehow the Russian military had reconfigured itself into smaller battle groups, um, use of artillery, clever use of combined arms, and supposedly taking the command structure much lower down, so the decision-making process much lower down on the ground forces level, uh, rather than that traditional hierarchical, very, you had to be a fairly superior figure to be actual giving any orders out in the Russian military in the old Soviet era. So one of the th comments I just wanted to mention, which was in the press, and it says, the systems that the West used to evaluate the Russian military have failed nearly as comprehensively as that military has. We bought in too much to the Russian army propaganda of how they had reformed, of the technology they were putting into service, look on the internet, the uh, loads of material on T-14, Amata, the latest Russian tank, with admittedly, you know, if you were there and you picked it apart, you could see some was absolute obvious Russian propaganda, 
but it was also people buying into with a sense of naivety too much of what was being said without doing that research. What have we seen of T14 Amata in this campaign? Absolutely nothing. So in some of these areas, we've, we've swallowed the classic Putin line on things. And that's true about armor in particular as well, which is their training, their scale, how they've reconfigured, etc. Too many people went along with that without some sort of skepticism. Their modernization has certainly taken place in some areas, but one of the things that's come out from a lot of the videos from um, combat, from prisoners of war that the Ukrainians have taken, that has not got down the food chain. It may well have been something advertised at a trade fair or said that the Russian military are now taking on board. It's pretty obvious that the frontline troops serving in vehicles like T-72 B3s some of them just quite simply have not had the training on using that material to its best effect. Some of them as well, it's, they are simply unable to use the more sophisticated technology that's been issued to them. So there's an example of a tank being captured. The latest sighting system is still in its grease proof wrapper. It's not actually been um, deployed in any way on that actual vehicle. So this inability of the Russians to undertake what I would call the complex operations and also the complete lack of, of robustness in their logistical ability to keep those units in the field has been quite an eye-opener and I think all around. Um, and it's also seen, we've got to also say as well, that one of the things we've been seeing in this conflict is new technologies being not just used for the first time, because some of them have been out there for a while, but being heavily recorded because this really is a social media war. So, so often we're being able to see footage, um, sometimes from the directly from the sighting systems of some of this weaponry. And we're actually seeing it, not quite live time, but the day after, etc. cetera. Um, and that's been giving us a, a brand new impression of how in some of the areas, technology such as drones, are being used very, very effectively, and some of the anti-tank handheld weapons, Enlaw, Javelin, etc. Um, we've been seeing some of those again being used in a way um, that has been, you know, no two ways about it, decimating some of these Russian armoured columns. But again, I would suggest as well that the immediate, therefore, headline that comes out of that, the end of the tank, tanks are now redundant, obsolete. Um, Hang on a second, let's watch that and let's just see about that. Because, again, taking the historical context in here, let's just have a look at this tank in the terms of its historical place on the battlefield. Even in the First World War, after the Battle of Passchendaele, there was doubt about the utility of the tank. It had been this new weapon, it had cost quite a bit of money, taken a fair amount of resource, it didn't seem to have made that fundamental difference on the battlefield. So after Passchendaele, even in the British High Command, there was doubts about the utility of the tank in the future. Cambrai, the battle there, changed that for the British Army and changed the perception of the tank. And it certainly changed the Germans' views, perception of the tank, who were fighting against it. Immediately after the First World War, um, a, a general, a British general, Major General Sir Louis Jackson, December 1919, this is his quote, the tank proper was a freak. The circumstances which called it into existence were exceptional and not, not likely to recur. If they do, they can be dealt with by other means. Now, I'm going to give a couple of other quotes as well, just rub out the dates and think, you know, would they still be the sort of thing you might read in the papers today? But that was Britain in 1919 from a senior officer's position. There were great doubts in the interwar period. The Americans got rid of their tank corps. Uh, the French absorbed theirs into other arms. So it's British, we downsize ours enormously, but we keep a tank corps going and we do experimentations with those vehicles. The anti-tank threat as well was considered heavily in the 20s and 30s. If we can get mobile anti-tank guns, that negates the idea behind the tank of firepower, mobility and protection on the battlefield. So it's not going to be quite so good. But we see that with World War II, all of a sudden the tank seems to come to a maturity and it's a dominant force on the ground battlefield. So 
that's where you know the tank has its moment and has its probably I would perhaps argue its its key moment in terms of scale of influence etc and the mass production of tanks in World War II look at all the other tank chats we talk about that but at the end of the Second World War we're getting Panzerfaust we're getting bazookas we've got that question starting to be raised again which is if one soldier can knock out a whole tank with a handheld weapon, are they going to be too vulnerable? Can we change the tactics again to, to negate this threat that's there? The Americans got to the point where uh, a gentleman called Dr. Vannevar Bush, he's the head of the Office of Scientific Research and Development in 1950, he pronounces, he's on the front of Time magazine, you know, he's, he's a big name out in the States at the time, the tank is obsolete. That's the end of the tank. And then, of course, what happens later in 1950 is the Korean War kicks off. Tanks are being used again in large numbers. The US military had gone down in, I think it was 1948, to one tank division. Suddenly has to reinvest in tanks again. There's a bit of a hurry to get more tanks on the drawing board and, uh, and put into production. The Soviet Union through this period, by the way, they, they go a different direction. They are saying, nope, we still want the tank, and they build them in large numbers. There's a bit of a wobble from Khrushchev, who is not so sure about heavy tanks, but vast numbers of tanks are evolutionary developed from the T-54, T-55. We've done our tank chat on the T-62. We haven't got a T-64 here, but we did our tank chat on the 72. That idea of taking forward an attack tank tends to be lighter, good firepower, relatively thin armour comparative to some other vehicles at the time, keep the weight down, get rid of the loader um, and have an auto loader system put in. That was the development of the Russians and they really invested heavily in large scale armies with a large tank force. And I've got a figure here that still beggars belief when you read it. 1st of January 1990, the Soviet Union reported to the United Nations it had 63,900 tanks on its books. Um, so, you know, still staggering numbers there in the Cold War. Even Yom Kippur, the Saga anti-tank missile, about 800 Israeli vehicles, not all armour, different types, knocked out by Sagas. So again, that enormous amount in the press at the time saying, is this the end of the tank? Uh, again, the Israelis reconfigure they change their tactics and still use their tanks to great effect and in following conflicts as well. 1980s, attack helicopters. We suddenly think that that's what's going to be the greatest threat to armour on the battlefield in the future. Um, does that mean to say, here we go again, the end of the tank? So for me, what I, I think when we're looking at this, in this historical context of the museum here, does this latest losses of the Russian forces, their tanks, their armour, their medium weight vehicle in such large numbers, is this really spelling the end of the tank as we, uh, for the future? Is it because we've now got new weapon systems such as very effective uh, shoulder launched anti-tank missiles, we've got drones being used in very creative ways now to take out heavy armour, um, what we seems like somehow some sort of sense of ease. Um, I've mentioned all those previous, the death of the tanks being announced. I think we are premature to say this conflict is going to mean the end of tanks on the battlefield in the future. And that's not just because, again, if I was a betting man, I'd just be a, be a bit risky sort of saying it now, because when so many examples are there in the past of how they've reconfigured and being able to reuse tanks, but it's also is let's just look at the evidence on the battlefield at the moment. Why the Ukrainian forces very keen to acquire more tanks from NATO? When we see the Ukrainian forces at some point in the future, and it may not be that far off, using their tanks to great effect, and I believe they will be able to do that, then are we all going to be changing those headlines to more tanks are needed? And as you can imagine, lots of Western, lots of NATO countries at the moment are, I hopefully, looking at their own plans and conditions because all warfare, like Mike Tyson says, everyone's got a plan until you're hitting the mouth. All warfare is going to end up being a real mixed battle 
um, especially with that new technology out there. So are we in NATO, it's all very well us looking gleefully at the Russian army failing abysmally in so many areas, are we going to do better? So let's just make sure we've got our own house in order first on that. Um, but are we also going to be saying we do need more tanks? Because again, just when the first machine gun came out and it didn't make the infantry soldier redundant, it's that idea of, are you honestly going to say, you are going to say goodbye to mobility, protection um, and firepower on the battlefield that is really what a tank seems to um, embody. Um, I just don't think that's going to be the case. We're going to find ways of using our tanks uh, in a better manner, certainly, than what the Russians are doing at the moment. Armour, infantry cooperation, air cover, etc. There are going to be new technologies we're going to be seeing more of, such as anti-drone technologies, um, hard kill and soft kill, which doesn't seem to be deploying very well on the Russian tanks at the moment. In other words, systems to detect incoming things such as N-laws or javelins and to be able to fire out something to hopefully disrupt them, um, or certainly from the NATO's point of view, whatever the Soviets or the Russian forces might be firing back the other way. How do we protect against that? And I would also say as well, just the, the obvious thing, that those tanks that we're seeing getting knocked out are being used by troops that are poorly trained and not motivated. And I come back to, we've said it about tank chats before, you can be given, and uh, as militaries, we need to give our soldiers the best equipment possible where we can, and it's got to be one hopes that can overmatch the enemy, but at the same time, that is no point having technology if the troops haven't been trained or, dare I say, they don't believe what they're fighting for. And in the case of the Russian army at the moment, when you've got T-72 crews giving up their vehicles, um, believing they were being sent on an exercise um, that are basically conscripts that have got no actual feeling that they want to be where they are in the fight, they've got no necessarily belief in their cause, um, that tank, whatever it is, is utterly useless. It's down to the crew and the motivation of that. And you can see that with how the Ukrainians are using the material they've got. They're defending their country. They have a belief in their cause. And as far as I can see at the moment, they are winning. Uh, I know where my heart lies in this fight. Um, let's watch it. Let's keep, um, we'll try and keep you updated about the things we know about, but we'll also try and put it in that wider historic context.